Here is a very damp church tower. This paper originates in research by Keystone for Historic England, part of their Damp Towers project. In the course of time, it will be on the web, including a very long list of acknowledgements. The brief was to look at the documentary evidence for Devon's church towers having been plastered, rough cast or lime washed externally in the past. No field work, no mortar analysis, these being dealt with separately by HE. HE gave us a free hand and we strayed outside Devon and beyond church towers. Firstly, did we find any documentation that might be of a special interest to this forum? Well, probably nothing unfamiliar to you. Whatever the date, rendering or re-rendering a church tower was a massive expense for a parish, comparable only to the cost of removing, recasting and rehanging bells. Here at East Portalmouth in 1802, the church wardens record nine shillings paid for settling the slap dashing of the tower and craning. Then after a one shilling prayer for a good harvest, payment to William Physick for slap dashing the tower, 20 pounds. Cost must surely have been a reason for periodic neglect. Here in an 1842 illustration of Aylesbeer Church, the artist has shown the tower render falling off. We found one 16th century reference to salt at Yatton in Somerset, where lime was burnt on or close to the site of the church. There's a payment for half a bushel of salt to be parging of ye chapel, followed by paid for parging of ye chapel within and without. In 1526, lime was being burnt on site at Stowe Gersey in Somerset using son from the sea. Lime was not invariably burnt on site, at Dartmouth it was bought in. The Dartmouth accounts for 1530 refer to five ponchons of hot lime, six shillings and tenpence. A ponchon was a large cask. I don't think the phrase hot lime is used here in the way it is <coughs> used today. So much for the detail. I'm giving the rest of this talk back to front, starting with the conclusion and then with some examples of the evidence. There were about 470 medieval parishes in Devon. In terms of numbers, and bearing in mind the very patchy and incomplete nature of the data, we found documentary or material evidence for historic lime finishes on about 20% of church towers of medieval origin. Jerry Sampson has undertaken a similar piece of research in Somerset and discovered a figure of 38%. The discrepancy is larger than it looks because Jerry didn't count in the Somerset Towers that are rendered today. We did for Devon, perhaps rather unwisely, assuming that cement render was a case of re-rendering towers that had once been lime rendered. Somerset has a much bigger collection of images of churches in the 1830s and 1840s than Devon does, and this probably explains the discrepancy. Here is Troll Church, illustrated in 1832 by Buckler, and as it is in 2021. Like us, Jerry was very conscious of just how limited the documentary data is. Written descriptions, illustrations and church wardens accounts do not give us anything like the complete record, and the vast majority of documentation is 19th century. But here is something earlier. Ashburton Church Tower was built before 1449. It has church wardens accounts that predate the Reformation, one of only 11 examples in Devon. In 1500 to 1501, the tower was rough cast, as you can see on the right. In the same accounting year, an aisle was rough cast and roofed. This is at least 50 years after the tower was built, so this rare example of early documentation doesn't tell us if this was remedial because the tower had become damp, or was it rough cast from the outset to reduce damp or for appearance, or both. We came across one document, and one only, a medieval agreement dated 1508-9, which clearly states that a planned tower was to be lime finished from the outset. This was at Wickham, Wickham in Buckinghamshire. William Chapman, a mason from Surrey, agreed that all the walls of the new Wickham tower would be rough cast outside and pargeted inside. 
and Jerry came across one reference to a lime finish at Bassingbourne, Cambridgeshire in 1516-1517. This was a payment to William Bull for pargeting the North Isle for weather, i.e. against the weather. And as regards appearance, Ashburton was described in the 19th century by Sir Stephen Glynn as built of very poor stone and covered with stucco. Would the coarse rubble of Ashburton have been an acceptable finish in the 15th or 16th century? If we look for earlier evidence, rendered stone walls have been identified at both Jarrow and Monk Wearmouth. The most impressive, fairly early example comes from the excavations at York Cathedral. These revealed the remains of the lower walling of the 11th century cathedral and its external lime render. This was lined out in red. Lines were scribed for the painter to fill in. This finish was just one element in a combination of what we might call polytexture and polychrome, as this quote from the RCHME publication explains. Cobbles were laid round the building, at least at the west end. Above this, the off-white stucco which covered the exterior would have been set off by the dark coarse-grained stone of the weathering course which ran round the building above the two, sometimes three courses of flush-pointed rubble facing. The red lining out of the plaster in imitation of masonry joints which gave the illusion of ashlar would have been obvious only close to the building. The overall brightness of the finish would have given the church a very striking appearance. There was also evidence of openings left unplastered to stand out from their bright background. The interpretation of the evidence here is that the rendered finish was primary, it was decorative and was used to reinforce structural and functional elements of the design. We do not know whether it was also intended to be protective of the masonry. But we cannot assume from a small number of early examples that external render was to be found on every top quality medieval church building. John Allen, the cathedral archaeologist, tells me that no evidence of external lime finish has been found at Exeter Cathedral, either on the 12th century transeptal towers or the mostly 14th century rebuild. The principal building stones of these phases are Solcombe Regis with some later beer stone and the external facing is neatly squared coarse blocks with thin joints. One example of a thin render emerged recently on a 13th century wall, an early phase of the chapter house and this wall had previously been concealed. This was built of roughly coarse red sandstone. The bulk of the documentation we found for parish churches was 19th century. Here are a few examples. Sir Stephen Glynn visited 210 churches in Devon before 1874, sometimes making return visits. He does occasionally but not consistently note what he describes as stucco. The Tower of Exminster Church is now presented faced with the coarse conglomerate heavy tree Brecher, but Glynn describes it as covered with a white stucco of disagreeable appearance and similar to other nearby churches. It was stripped before 1860. Glynn is an exception. Written descriptions of medieval churches in the 19th century usually omit to say whether the exterior was lime finished or not. Was this because it was just too commonplace to be mentioned? Curiously enough, the modern list descriptions in Pevsner also sometimes omit to mention external finishes, whether cement or lime, as if somehow their impact on the architecture is insignificant. We also look for images and included churches that have been demolished. Here are a couple of Exeter examples, St George on the left and St Mary Major, which stood immediately west of the cathedral on the right. Atherington Church in North Devon in an 1881 watercolour sketch showing it rendered compared with 2021. It was stripped in the 1882 restoration by J.L. Pearson. It's built of the local slate stone rubble. Unusually, the newspaper account of the reopening of the church does refer to the architect's stripping of the exterior and why this was done. 
on stripping the fair outside of rough cast and plaster from the external surface of the chancel walls, they were found to be in such a condition that it was necessary to take down and rebuild a considerable portion of them. And walls elsewhere also required similar treatment, including even the apparently solid and substantial tower. The walls have now been made perfectly solid and the whole of the masonry has been restored. Reading between the lines here, I think the chancel, the most important element of the church for the Victorians, was stripped to make it conform to the Victorian perception of the ruggedness and truth of Gothic mason work. This revealed condition problems which meant the rest of the exterior was stripped and the masonry repaired by rebuilding a common Victorian practice. I understand that the tower is now damp, as well as looking very earthbound relative to its more beacon-like appearance when it was rough cast. Photographic evidence was of a special interest at Newton St Sires just outside Exeter, many thanks to John Scott and the PCC for this. The church was stripped externally in 1913 by E. H. Harbottle, a reminder that the first 20 years of the 20th century was a very active stripping period. But when was the rough cast applied? The Victorians have surprisingly little to say about the dating of external line finishes, but what they do say implies that they thought it was Georgian. They were right in so far as most examples of church rebuilding in the 1820s and 30s were rendered. Could the rough cast here have been applied in 1831 when the church was restored? Well, no, at least not on the tower. The stair turret looks convincingly medieval to me, although Harbottle raised it above the parapet. But as John Scott, the architect, the church architect, spotted, the construction of the tower stair turret has trapped undoubtedly earlier medieval rough cast on the south wall of the tower proving both that the stair turret is secondary, something of a surprise, and proof positive that the tower was rendered in the medieval period. In addition to the text and illustrations, at least 63 Devon church towers are rendered today, most with cement render, but a handful re-rendered using lime since the late 1980s. If we assume that cement was a replacement for lime, we have material evidence here of historic lime finishes on some towers for which we've not found documentation. Here are a few of those 63 towers, some grand and three-stage like Ippelpen, some humble and two-stage like Buckerel. They include rural churches like Torbryan and urban like Exeter St Stephen's. Some are partially rendered like Dunchidock, and some have render used as polytexture like Holcomb Burnell, where the rendered elements contrast with the cut stone buttresses and parapet. So what about negative evidence? Well, the constructional polychrome and polytexture on these towers, one in Reading just post-Reformation and Stowford in Devon, were self-evidently designed to be seen and not lime covered. But we found ourselves rather flummoxed by a group of late medieval Dartmoor towers. These are all faced with large, neatly coarse squared blocks of granite. For these, apart from one, we found no documentation for lime finishes, but that might be because the documentation was simply missing. Were they always presented as naked stone, though? If lime finishes were commonly used for weather protection, why not here on Dartmoor, exposed to more wind-driven rain than most? I'm told by Historic England that some of these towers are quite as damp now as the slate stone rubble ones. Well, what can we extrapolate of the whole medieval picture from the very superficial documentary numbers plus some negative evidence and some areas of uncertainty? Well, without some very clever maths theorem that would take into account the huge gaps in the data, we are in the realms of guesswork. And I would like to tentatively guess that, firstly, we have a mixed picture of some but, all, but not all parish churches lime finished, but that, secondly, lime finishes played an important part in how medieval churches were intended to be seen, as well as providing weather protection, although the balance between the two remains a puzzle. 
and furthermore, I would guess that churches built of rubble were always rendered. Glynn, visiting Kenton in the 19th century, wrote of the tower, the redstone has never been covered with rough cast. Well, we might be sceptical about his confidence here, seeing as renders as well as lime wash can disappear pretty much without trace. But it is worth comparing the coarsed, squared breccia facing here of Kenton with the volcanic stone and breccia rubble of the Tower of Exeter St Thomas. At St Thomas, we have multiple sources of documentation proving that the tower and the whole church was rough cast in the 19th century. Once your eye is in, you just long for the messy looking patchy surface of St Thomas to be smoothed over with a lime finish, just making it easier to see the architecture. Churches where render was contrasted with exposed squared stone buttresses and parapets were described dismissively by Glynn as piebald. But I would propose that the tower at Berry Pomeroy in 2021 looks the way it was intended using a lime finish in contrast with the local redstone buttresses for polychrome and polytexture. At Manhattan, the squared cut granite contrasted with render is also perhaps as the church was presented in the late medieval period. I think it likely that the panel of rubble over the porch has lost its render and the church would look a great deal better if it was reinstated. One of my friends and colleagues, agreeing in principle with Glynn, described Manhattan to me glumly as looking like a half-sucked sweet. A reminder, perhaps, that we are entirely the children of the Victorians in our assumption that naked masonry was the norm for medieval church exteriors.